So Peter and Jack talked about the weaknesses of some of the contending teams. So now we're going to be a little bit more positive. I'm Aram Layton. He's Peter Apple for this Thursday, January 19th episode. We're talking about strengths of contenders. Peter took the American League. I took the National League. And Peter, a little bit more fun to be positive about these teams, right? And, and a lot of these teams have a lot to be positive about. So Jack and I, we talked about it. It is more fun because I think it makes people happier. And as a podcast, as the Just Baseball Show, we love making people happy. But there is a part of us deep down that loves shitting on teams. That's kind of how we're built. That's baseball. That's arguing about sports in general. But I'm glad to turn the page. We just called a bunch of teams ass. (laughs) Now let's give some teams some flowers because they do deserve it, like you said. Well, and what's fun is, you know, I think we're going to we're going to really uh, revert back to the uh, negativity with some of the team's weaknesses, some of the bad team's weaknesses next week, which should be pretty funny. I'm excited <laughs> to talk about the Royals riveting rotation, uh, but I'm excited to talk about some of these really good teams because I don't know about you, Peter, because we haven't really talked about what we were going to say about each team. We just kind of clarified which teams we wanted to talk about, which were the clear cut contenders and the teams that were eight teams of each league that were projected to win the most games to try to keep it as simple as possible. So people aren't like, Hey, why didn't you talk about this team? We almost ended up listing every single team, but with some of these, with the really good ones, I'm sure you had this problem with the Astros. I had this problem with the Dodgers. I kind of struggled to pick a strength because some of these teams are kind of strong everywhere. So I'm excited to see, you know, where you decided the ultimate strength was for each of these teams. And I think it's it's kind of debatable. So you want to start it off first with with the American League and, and we'll go into there. Yeah, before just to clarify, it's funny. We probably spent more time figuring out which teams are viable contenders rather <laughs> yeah. than finding their strengths because with some teams it's clear other teams like you said the Astros like I have or the daughters that you have there is no wrong answer but I think the conversation about where they're strongest you'll see wow this unit or this part of this team is incredible so yeah I'll start in the American League I'll work division by division starting in the American League East um and remember we took all the teams who are projected to win about 80 games or above. So there are some teams like the Twins or the Cubs in the National League where they didn't make this. The (laughs) Orioles are another example where we put them in the contender, you know, circle. But for this list, we could just name every team that has a shot. But these teams have real shots, at least according to the Vegas odds of where their projected win total is at. So I'm going to start with the Yankees that are projected to win over 95 games. I think even with Frankie Montas being out, the rotation is still the strongest aspect of this team. Mm -hmm. You have Garrett Cole at the top of the rotation with Carlos Rodon. That's as good of a one-two as you're going to find. Both of them, you will find, will be in our top 10 pitchers when we come out with the top 10s. They are as good of a one-two punch as you you can possibly have. But then moving down the line, there are a lot of other good pitchers in this rotation, most notably Nestor Cortez Jr., who was an all-star and was one of the best pitchers last year in the American League. And I think rounding out um, the five spot you can see in that rotation, it should be either like Domingo Herman, it might be Clark Schmidt. And then when you get Frankie Montas back, it's a really good rotation. And the only reason I didn't mention Luis Severino is when he's on, he gives you ace-type starts. But the problem is, when is he on the field? But if you can get 120 to 150 innings out of Luis Severino, this is still the greatest area of strength for the Bronx Bombers, which is kind of funny. Which is ironic because I agree. This is a pitching-centric team, or at least you know, pitching-led team. And what's interesting is, I want to ask you this. Who is the five? Let's assume Frankie Montes is... Somewhere between what he was before he went down and what he was with the A's, which you know, let's say 70% of the peak of Frankie Montas. Is, is that better than Nestor Cortez? It, who is the five here? Because if, if Frankie Montas is your five and or Nestor Cortez is your five, that is the best five in baseball. I don't know. I might be missing one, but that's got to be one of the best five starters in baseball. It is. 
It is. And you could say that Domingo Herman, but I am a Domingo Herman hater. I don't hide from that. I don't like his off the field issues at all. I've been very outspoken about it. Marcelo Zuna, the same thing. Aroldis Chapman, the same thing. I don't root for these players. I would prefer as a Yankee fan for them not to be on the team. I know Yankee fans like Domingo Herman on the field because he is a pretty decent, he's a pretty pitcher. solid he's an, starter. I mean, have an it, ERA in the yeah. threes and he's going to be fine. Like he's yeah. not going to be that much of a drop off from a Jamison Tyone. So yeah, yeah, he's going to be in there. I don't love it, but they have other guys like Clark Schmidt can start games. They have other guys in, you know, the minor leagues. Like we've seen Luis Heel flash excellence when he's on. Is he probably a bullpen guy? Probably, but he's the eighth starter in line. And then they have a bunch of other of those guys in the minor leagues. Like we could see Debbie Garcia, probably mm-hmm. not. I don't know what's happening with him, but they could go eight or nine deep yeah. on top of having the most top heavy front four as any team in baseball i agree i agree so how, how do you want to do this you want to go back and forth or do you want to keep going uh american league bang those out and then we'll go national league consecutive i think i think we'll go so i'll go yankees you go mets so we'll just keep alternating all right yeah so i'll start with the national league east and with the new york mets it's funny both new york teams both teams i think are very pitching driven and for them for me the mets rotation is their strength of course you've got two hall of famers at the top so if you're talking about you know one of the best one-two punches. I think it's going to be a really co- fun competition between the Mets starters and the Yankee starters. And I think it's really going to come down to availability. Is Rodon going to be pitching all year? And and are the guys that you know the, the Mets have added here with Justin Verlander and, of course, Max Scherzer, are they going to be available all year? Uh, I think in a perfect world, all four are. And you're going to have probably those two being the best one-two punches in baseball. We've talked about Kodai Senga. I really think Kodai Sanga is going to be closer to a two than a four. Uh, We'll see. You know, it's always a bit of a test coming over and pitching in the MLB, but it's a little bit uh, when you throw 102 and you have the stuff and the splitter and the breaking ball that Sanga has, I have a feeling he's going to be closer to that too. You add Jose Quintana, who is no slouch in his own right. And even if he regresses, that's a really good four. And then if Cookie Carrasco is your five, that's another guy that's in the in the conversation of one of the best five starters in baseball. Uh, this Mets rotation, I think, is going to be competing with the Yankees for best rotation in baseball. I think there's a couple other candidates there that we'll get to, but I think you could easily make the case for these two to be the favorites, to be the most dominant. Yeah, so and I think trying to predict what Kodai Senga is going to do is an impossible task. But we can look at prior history and some players who came over. And Masahiro Tanaka comes to mind. Um, While Tanaka did have a better career in the MPB and, you know, what seemed like a better pitcher coming over and was younger, put up a 277 ERA in 136 innings. And then in the next season, he put around a 351 um, in 154. Then next year, 307 in 199 innings. I almost think that Maybe we have a little bit of a drop-off for Senga. Maybe he looks like the 2015 version of Tanaka, where he throws about 150 innings at around a 3-4, 3-5 ERA. That's very solid if he's striking out a decent amount of guys with how good you think his stuff is. 100%. And the stuff's crazy. We've talked about it a little bit. Fastball sits 96. The splitter is... Yeah, as good as any splitter that we've seen coming out of there. And then the cutter is really solid. The slider is really solid. And he'll even mix in a changeup. Basically, what it boils down to for me, Peter, is do you think he's going to be better than Chris Bassett? Yes. Right. And I think, you know, maybe not by a ton, but I think he's going to be better than Chris Bassett. And then I think Quintana is still going to be really steady. And then I'm very interested to see what Carrasco does. I think the Yankees rotation has a little bit more upside, but... I honestly think this Mets rotation can be right there. And even though the lineup's darn good, some some holes here and there, you know, if Correa was there, it'd be a little bit different. I think we could make a really strong case that the lineup's right there. But ultimately, I, I give the nod to this rotation that I think is going to carry them because this was a top five rotation in F war last year with Jacob DeGrom barely pitching. So now they add somebody like Verlander, who's going to throw more innings than, you know, hopefully than what they got from DeGrom last year, which was just a handful. And and I think this is going to be a very productive rotation. I think this Mets rotation is a higher floor than the Yankees, but to your point, I think the Yankees has a bit higher of the upside, Mm -hmm. but a rotation that actually could be better than both of these Tampa Bay Rays, their rotation is their biggest strength. You have Shane McClanahan at the top who 
is arguably one of the best left-handed pitchers in baseball and is arguably one of the best overall pitchers in baseball. But then you put behind him Tyler Glass now, who is in that same conversation as when he is on the field, he's about as electrifying as we have in our game. We saw that in the playoffs firsthand when he dominated the Cleveland Guardians when he was fully healthy. Then you add Drew Rasmussen, who was great for them (laughs) last year and really developed that breaking ball and became a mainstay in the rotation. If you remember, Rasmussen came over in the Willie Adames trade um, with J.P. Fireheisen as well. Now, Fireheisen is currently um, – did he get picked up by anybody? He got picked up by – Dodgers? Was it the Dodgers? I think it was the Probably Dodgers. Probably the Dodgers. That makes all the sense in the world. But Dr- Rasmussen ended up being the best player in that deal, and he has been a rock-solid three. He'd be a two in most rotations, but for them, he's the three. Then you have Jeffrey Springs, who came yeah, on the, great left-handed Where did pitcher. that guy come from? <laughs> where did that guy come from? Like, he was a nothing burger for a while, and then the Rays just tooled with his breaking ball. Now look at him. And then you add Zach Eflin to the fold as the five. Mm-hmm. Like Zach Eflin, we saw with the Phillies last year, he was used more in a bullpen role, kind of a swingman type. But if that's your five and he gives you a four ERA and 140 innings, you can't find better five starters than that. So the Rays are known for their bullpen because they have Pete Fairbanks, Jason Adam, and the whole slew of them of guys you've never heard of that are going to throw 102 and have a two five ERA. But it's the rotation, especially this year, when all healthy, that could be the best in baseball. And, and a really fun X factor is Luis Patino. Uh, yep. what, are, what are they going to get from Patino? Because I, I I still believe in this guy. And he doesn't need not? to be that the frontline guy that everybody once hoped he could be, right? We're talking about maybe trying to fill in on that fifth spot or, or plug in whenever you need for a spot start. They got Patino and then they got Taj Bradley not far away. And then I know Shane Boz is not going to factor in this year, most likely. But that's another guy that, man, this rotation is going to be good for a long time. So they've got some some backup plans as well, uh, which I always like when we're talking about like, oh, this is their five starter. And if you notice all of these rotations, they all have very solid five starters. I also love to see that some of these rotations have somebody that they can plug in if somebody goes down, because unfortunately in baseball, pitching injuries are are inevitable. And, you know, the Rays weathered that storm last year, and I think they're in a little bit better of a spot health wise this year. It all really hinges on what is up with McClanahan now, right? We saw the shoulder, you know, be an issue last year. He gets that injection. He pitches in the playoffs. Let's hope he's healthy this year because I think that's a, that's a guy that could swing this rotation one way or another. I think if we're talking upside, the Rays could be the best rotation in baseball, but I would say that they have the lowest floor yeah. between the Yankees and the Mets yeah. because yeah. every yeah. single guy in this rotation has either not a long track record or has been prone to injury. Correct. But if they all stay healthy and they all match the productivity of their best years, this is an amazing rotation. Totally agree. Totally agree. So that sends me back to the NL East with the Philadelphia Phillies. And for them, you know, they've they've addressed the bullpen, which I think is going to be a sneaky strength. They've addressed the starting pitching in some ways, which which should be better. But let's be real. This is this is a team that mashed their way through the playoffs. And, you know, I know they have the one two punch at the top, but this lineup and specifically the power that they have uh, is, is what's going to carry them. And I know they don't have Bryce Harper for the beginning of the season, but they finished the season last year 11th in WRC plus they add Trey Turner. That should help quite a bit. This is also was a team that saw a lot of strong second halves. So I'm interested to see how that kind of carries over into 2023, right? A really strong second half from Bryson Stott, a good second half from Alec Bohm, even a better second half from a Brandon Marsh who they acquired, you know, at near the deadline. I think this is a lineup that got better as the year went on. And I think it's going to continue to keep that momentum going into 2023. And then they'll add Bryce Harper to the fold. This team just absolutely crushes home runs. They were sixth in MLB in home runs last year. And that's with Castellanos being atrocious, only hitting 13 home runs. I feel like Castellanos can't be worse. If he takes a step forward this, this coming season, it doesn't need to be a big one, just a small step forward. This offense should see a nice boost. And I expect it to be one of the best offenses in baseball. So I separated it into infields and outfields because I wanted to find, like, for example, we talked about the Rangers outfield and I totally agree that the entire lineup for the Phillies is their clear strength and that doesn't take anything away from their bullpen or their starting rotation it just goes to show you look at the rotation you look at the bullpen and the offense is that much better I was looking at the Phillies because before we decided American League I was thinking this Phillies infield yeah so elite arm at third base Alec Bohm shortstop Trey Turner 
You love Bryson Stott. Who mm-hmm. doesn't? He's going to be a great second baseman. Oh, yeah. Reese Hoskins is 30 and 90, 30 and 100 every single every year. year. Yeah, he sucks with the glove, but whatever. Then it, you have the best catcher in baseball in JT Romuto. Like, what an infield. That's where I felt was the biggest strength if you had to find one within their lineup. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll focus on on specific infield, outfield as we as we go forward with the next ones. But I agree that if you ask me, well, RM pick, infield or outfield. Obviously, even with Harper in the fold there, that's a really good outfield, but I, I agree with you, man. This infield, and it's especially kind of going back to what I said, the trend of that infield too, right? You've got superstar with Trey Turner. You've got steady, steady with Reese Hoskins. And then you've got the third baseman and the second baseman and Stott and, and Bohm really heading upwards, right? Continuing to get better. This infield's only going to get better. And, and JT was, was just phenomenal. So yeah, this is a really, really good infield. And to, to kind of tease the, podcast that we're about to drop on on our network who's better baseball that ryan finkelstein our managing editor is going to be hosting a really fun debate is is you know some of these infields in the nl east comparing them because you, know, you got the mets infield which is really good you got the phillies infield which is really good you got the braves infield which is really good and all of these stack up pretty well so it's going to be a fun year in the national league east another great infield toronto blue jays that's their biggest strength bobachette at shortstop matt chapman at third base Vladimir Guerrero Jr. at first base. And then you have a combination of Santiago Espinal, who's one of the best like utility men, or at least he proved it last year. But you also have Whit Merrifield, who's been there, done that, and whatever he gives you, it's going to be good, gritty baseball. And then at catcher, you have Alejandro Kirk, who established himself as what I think is a top five, top six in that range type of catcher. This infield, this whole lineup is so good, especially adding the outfield. With, now you have Springer and Wright. You have Kevin Kiermaier, who can still get to any ball, and Dalton Varsho, who can also get to any ball and play catcher. Yeah, he can also the catch. Rotation, the rotation is really good. You know, um, I really like some of their additions in Chris Bassett. Um, we'll see what we get from Brios and Kikuchi. That's why, as good as Minoa and Gosman are, the rotation isn't their strength. And the bullpen is still good with the addition of Eric Swanson, but it's not their strength. The infield is as good as any in Major League Baseball. You could potentially have from this infield three all-star level players yeah. from Bichette, Chapman, and Vladimir Guerrero Jr., and then four if you count Kirk. It is as good as anyone. And I don't know if this counts towards the infield, but like even a, a Brandon Belt for when Vladdy is is off, right? I'm sure he's going to get days at the DH role and Belt will make some starts here and there at first base. Like that's, that's a really good fill in DH slash first baseman to have in the fold there. Platoon guy that if he's facing righties is going to mash. And then Danny Chanson. It's as good as anyone. Y- your backup catcher is arguably a top 10 or 12 catcher in the game. I'd have to list them all out in front of me, but he's one of the better catchers in baseball. <laughs> like this whole team is loaded. And then Kevin Biggio plays all over, but that's another really good, you know, bench bat that can play the infield. So the depth that they have as well, you talk about the star power, also a ton of depth with that infield. So this is, this is another one that I don't know if people really talk about it as much because we get focused on the individual names that the Blue Jays have with the star power. But in terms of just the whole infield, it's, it's really darn good. It's as good as anybody in major league baseball. It is so loaded. I'm kind of, I'm excited to see, you know, how they maneuver all of these guys too, right? Like is Varsho ever going to catch? They already have two stud catchers. Does Jansen end up seeing ABs elsewhere because he kind of rakes too. Like Van Graaff's has him projected for 23 homers this year. He's, That's a guy that would need to be in the lineup a lot to hit 23. <laughs> like I'm really excited. I'm really excited to see how they, how they allocate the at-bats around this, this lineup. Cause it's deep. Easily the best backup catcher in baseball. I don't even know. Oh, yeah, that that I will say definitively. I don't even have to look at everybody. I will say without a doubt. Would you rather have Danny Jansen or Christian Vasquez? Danny Jansen. Absolutely. And Christian Vasquez is like a top 15 catcher. Yeah. And you know, just just got paid and was traded for at the deadline to to start for or at least get get a B's for the uh, Astros, though. I think uh, Dusty Baker disagreed a little bit uh, and preferred Maldonado. But what division do you want me to go to next? I can go central. I can go west. Central. All right, let's go central. Uh, the west is definitely a little bit more fun, but with the central, we got to go with another. Let's stay on the theme of infields here, right? The St. Louis Cardinals have one of the most ridiculous infields defensively. I would say it's probably the best defensive infield in baseball. And then they kind of hit too, man. It can really hit, but you have... Arguably one of the best defensive third baseman in baseball history. And Nolan Arenado, by the time he's done, it might not even be arguable. You have Tommy Edmond at shortstop, who 
the numbers there, I mean, the advanced stats, and we, we talked about this when we had our top tens call, right? And um, we were talking about top shortstops and you were really making the case for Tommy Edmond. And I think Colby was too, with just how insane his defense was there, even in limited action. And I mean, that left side of the infield is going to be an absolute vacuum. You're not hitting a ball through that left side of the infield, right? And then they've had some injuries, so they had to move Brendan Donovan all over, but Donovan seems like he'll be able to more consistently play some second base. And then we know Paul Goldschmidt you know, plays great defense at first base. All of those guys can hit, which is the other part of it, which is really exciting. And then a catcher, oh, by the way, they added Wilson Contreras, who is going to produce a lot more than what Yachty did. Maybe he won't bring you all the intangibles, but the offensive uh, impact that they're going to add there is going to make a huge difference. This is another infield. I feel like where we, we repeat ourselves a little bit, but like, would you be surprised if this is the most productive infield in baseball, like in, in, in the F war department? Not even a little bit. You know, what's crazy. So this is from Danny Vietti who works for CBS sports. Really good guy. Definitely follow him on Twitter. It's at D a N N Y capital V I E T T I most defensive runs saved among national league players. Um, and defensive run saved is one of the best infield stats yep. that we have since 2008, Nolan Arenado, since 2009, Nolan Arenado, since 2010, Nolan Arenado, 2011, same 2012, same 13, same 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, Nolan Arenado. Yeah. He is as much of a lock to make the hall of fame. Yeah. He is Brooks Robinson yeah. with a better bat. He's yeah. going to go down as an all-time great. And the question was, how will he adjust from Colorado? Nah, he's he adjusted. <laughs> I think he fine. adjusted just fine. <laughs> and Paul Goldschmidt, the guy across the pond, almost won the MVP. I almost said yeah. almost for some reason. Yeah, He yeah. won the MVP. Correct. And then you have maybe the best defensive shortstop in baseball. And then you have a great second baseman in, in Brendan Donovan. And then you have Nolan Gorman backing it up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, right. Gorman is the backup there is ridiculous. You you platoon him, shelter him from lefties, and then Contreras. I mean, I love Yachty, but like, dude, like Contreras compared to what Yachty was last year, the amount that they are going to gain is ridiculous. So I, I mean, this is this is one of my favorite infields to watch. Period, and they're going to be a human highlight reel across the board. I'm going to mention another infield, and you might think it is. Uh, a crazy take to call the infield the best part of this team because the Cleveland Guardians are known for their bullpen and they have a slew of horses. And you could say the bullpen is the best unit and you might be right. The rotation, amazing, per usual. But my problem with the rotation is Plesak and Savali at the end. Will they be fine? Yeah, but there's not a super high ceiling for them. It's like they'll probably be pretty solid. Top three are going to be great. And that's the end of the story. But this infield with the addition of Josh Bell. So you have Josh Bell and Josh Naylor, who both top 15 at the position. I think yeah. that's fair. Yeah. Andres Jimenez is a top five second base and maybe higher. Ahmed Rosario is a very good shortstop. He like He's a good defender, gets on base, has a lot of speed. And then you have J-Ram. And then at catcher, we are really excited for the emergence of Bo Naylor. Yeah. Yeah, and I would argue that the Guardians, the best quality about them is this young, budding, super talented infield that are all great defenders, all have pop, and all have speed. You say Josh Naylor doesn't have speed? Watch some Cleveland Guardians game. The yeah. dude is an incredible athlete. Yeah. We spoke with Cal Quantra. We spoke with Nick Salen. They both pointed towards his athleticism. He is a crazy good athlete. We talked about his brothers, most notably Bo Naylor. This is a crazy athletic family. We're excited for the catcher. I would venture to say the infield is the best part of the Guardians. Look, I, I don't think that's crazy because of the drop off after after, you know, Quantrill. And and I know you love Cal, but even, you know, compared to some of the rotations we just talked about, Cal's really solid. But as a number three compared to, you know, maybe Kodai Sango, you're talking about upside. I, I'd probably take the upside of some of those other rotations, even. You know, maybe Sabrina. you would, but since 2021, Cal Quantrill's 15th in baseball in the ERA. That's all fair, I got to say. Fair. So, so you, you, you would you swap him for Sevy? You'd swap him for Sevy right now? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> like not but no, I, I I hear you on this because I, I think the rotation is going to get back to a strength when they get you know Gavin Williams up there and Espino, but those guys aren't quite there yet. Bieber, I hope he can stay healthy and duplicate what he did, but you know there there's definitely some concern there. I think the infield is really good, and I think if Bo Naylor gets his opportunities, which he probably will, uh, because and Zanino is a better version of Austin Hedges, I think. You know, a little bit more offense. He's going to do all the same things with the glove, so I think that's a marginal upgrade. And then Naylor could be a major upgrade behind the dish once they kind of let him loose and let him play, because he's another freak athlete too, just like his brother, if not more athletic, who can really swing it. So I don't think that's crazy at all. I, I think you know, on the surface, it's crazy, but when you break it down. I agree with you. I think the lineup, especially with how dynamic Jimenez has become and how good he is, uh, on top of the fact that I think we didn't even see anything close to what J Ram's going to do this year or last year. I think last year was disappointing, quote unquote, from him. I think he's going to come back with a vengeance this year. This 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 infield is going to be very very solid. Elite. I love the infield, and I like the point that you made because if Bo Naylor isn't ready yet even though we think he is, but he it happens. We're wrong all the time. Yeah. If Bo Naylor isn't ready, Mike Zunino is a very solid option because we aren't far removed from Mike Zunino being one of the better catchers in baseball. We're and, like a year removed from that. And he can't be worse than Austin Hedges with all due respect. I know they love Hedges. And Hedges like, is an amazing defender, and I want to give Hedges all the credit yes. in the world for being literally one of the best backstops defensively. But – by every metric, he is the worst offensive player in baseball <laughs> over the past couple of seasons. It's yeah, just yeah. a fact. But the Guardians kept him because of how good he is defensively. Mike Zunino is a drop-off defensively, but he's much better offensively, forming probably a better player. Yep, probably. And he you know, can still, still defend a little bit. Milwaukee Brewers, it's got to be the bullpen, you know, and, and this is a team that, you know, is, is on the lower uh, – a kind of a lower version of the contenders that we're talking about. So it makes it a little bit harder. I do think the Brewers can kind of find a way they did add Brian Anderson today to a $3.5 million deal, which almost made me pick the infield, Peter. Uh, but ultimately we go with the bullpen and I know they subtract Josh Hader, but I really think Devin Williams is, is continues to show us that he's one of the best relievers in the game. And I think he can continue that as, as one of the best closers in the game. I just don't think there's a way to hit that change up. I think it's very clear. Fitters would have figured it out. They would have by now, right? The way he manipulates it. I think he, he is an anchor for a bullpen and he's going to be a problem. Matt Bush was a sneaky, good addition. A guy that strikes out on 30% of batters. He's nasty. He had a pretty solid year last year. And then I really like Peter Strezelecki. I thought he was really solid for them next last year as a rookie. I think he's going to build on that. And then Aaron Ashby, the guy that they were trying to figure out, is he a starter? How are they going to use him? They might still try to use him as a starter, but they added Wade Miley. And I think it's because they prefer Ashby as a reliever. Didn't get too much action as a reliever, but even in his 20 innings or so, his sub-2 ERA, I think, uh, out of the bullpen, much better in that role. So I think the bullpen top to bottom is going to continue to be really good. They've got the established guys in the back end. They've got some exciting young guys who could make a leap. And ultimately, this is a team that's kind of always been built on the bullpen. I think you could make the case for the rotation, but I I just think there's a little bit too much unknown outside of the one-two punch at the top. Believe it or not, I completely disagree with you. And the reason that I disagree with you is, first, I think that there is some trepidation there with what are we going to get from Freddie Peralta? What are we going to get from some of these arms? But when I look at the Brewers bullpen, I talked about them as one of the biggest weaknesses. And the reason being is we know what we're going to get from Devin Williams. He's awesome. He's one of the best. You said Matt Bush is a good addition, but... 39-year-old Matt Bush, how good is he going to be? 37. 37. Well, no, I think he's going to be 38 opening day, or like he's age 38 season, I think. But he's he's older. Like, he's older. And, like, that's your number two. And what I spoke about with Jack was that do they actually want Ashby as a reliever? Because Ashby as a starter is still pretty solid. And then there are some guys in there who could be okay, but I almost think that we're so used to saying the Brewers and we see Devin Williams at the top and we just think this Brewers bullpen is going to be good. I would argue it's like the worst I've seen from the Brewers and that there's a lot of guys that are just not very good. And then some of the guys that you'd put in as some of the better bullpen arms 
should be starters and how well are they going to do if they're bouncing in between the rotation and the bullpen all the time and they won't have them in the bullpen like a Bryce Elder, like an Aaron Ashby. So I was venturing to say this is one of the weakest points of the Brewers. It's tough with it. The, this kind of doesn't bode well for the Brewers overall. I, I would say that if it's not the bullpen, it's the rotation, right? My concern is I don't love Eric Lauer. Um, I think he had a little bit of of a flash in the pan in the first half of last year, but at the end of the day, he was still a three, six, three, seven ERA guy, right? Freddie That's Peralta, if he's healthy is, is really solid. So yeah. Um, I could give you, I could give you the, the rotation still as the strength, of course, because you have Corbin Burns at the top, who's a Cy Young guy and you've got Brennan Woodruff who, who finished really strong last year. I think the big X factor is what do you get from Peralta? What does Eric Lauer look like? Does he look like first half Eric Lauer? Does it look like second half Eric Lauer? Why did you sign Wade Miley? And how do they use Aaron Ashby? Because I, I do think Ashby was really solid as a reliever. And and I, again, I do really like Strezelecki. I think he's going to be a solid seventh inning guy. But ultimately, I do think there's a lot of unknowns there. I I, I could I could understand that. I'm gonna I'm gonna I, I can rescind and go and go rotation because. I, I almost forgot how solid Peralta still was last year. Yeah. Like I thought I didn't really think he got 78 Freddy. innings. I know Freddie Freddie's an OG just baseball show. Guy. OG. I, I think you've convinced me. I think you've convinced me. I I'll I'll go rotation, but I will say with a little asterisk, I think the Brewers bullpen can be better than you think it is. I think that's very possible. Maybe I'm being too hard on them because I'm used We're to, used to being dominant. I'm dominant. used to hater Devin Williams and then the Brad Boxberger. But but, but I no agree Brad with Boxberger, you. no Trevor Gott, <laughs> Taylor <laughs> Rogers, who remember came over, yeah. mm-hmm. gone. They've lost a lot of their now, middle inning guys. You and you've sold you, them with you've sold me because the, the other thing too, man, is just like. You don't. It's it's hard to to deny just even the one two star power. We're talking about one two punches. Well, here's another one with Corbin yeah. Burns and Brandon Woodruff. I, I you've sold me enough on this one. I I think I talked myself into the bullpen a little bit too much. But why did they sign? Why did they sign Wade Miley? I'd rather just roll Aaron Ashby out there and see what happens and sign another reliever. Uh, or even I, I don't Bryce really Elder. Yeah, I, I don't really know. <laughs> what what the what the move was there for them but you know I, I think they'll be pretty pretty solid overall I think the bullpen will hold it hold its own yeah they'll win 82 games another team that will probably win 82 games and maybe you can convince me if I'm you know off here I'm going with the Chicago White Sox bullpen as their biggest strength you know um we're praying for Liam Hendricks non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, mm-hmm. we aren't exactly sure when he's going to come back I hope he comes back this year um, I think the White Sox are planning on him coming back this year. I know, you know, if you would talk to Liam Hendricks, who's one of the most competitive players in our game and one of the smartest guys knows his body, I think he's hoping he could come back this year. And you have Garrett Crochet, who had Tommy John last year. I don't know if he's going to factor in this year, but even if Crochet doesn't, they have Kendall Graveman, who is still one of the better relievers. Aaron Bummer, when healthy, is a disgusting lefty. Joe Kelly can still f- hit fuzz at 100 miles an hour. I mean, he can still be solid there. Reynaldo Lopez really came onto the scene and was dominant. Jake Diekman is another solid lefty. They got guys like Jose Ruiz and Jimmy Lambert and Nick Avila. Like, this is, we give the White Sox a lot of shit. This bullpen is still very, very good, I think. Yeah, I I don't know when they could. I think they could get Crochet back at some point during the season, which which should which should help them big time. Um, I'm not totally sure what his return is. That would really put this bullpen over the top. But Avila's kind of nasty. This was a Rule yeah. Five guy that his we we highlighted him on the call up because his pitch data is really nice. His fastball is nasty. That's a guy that I think could be a nice little uh, you know middle inning guy that. You're like, whoa, where did this guy come from? Just gassing dudes up with a fastball. And Kelly's probably the biggest X factor, right? If if he can be anything close to, to what we've known Joe Kelly as in the past, this bullpen could be really good. I, I think the, the rotation isn't too far off, but too, too many unknowns, right? Lance Lynn, big disappointment last year. Mike Clevenger, big disappointment last year. Lucas Giolito, big disappointment last year. Kopech could be great. Cease is an ace. But there's too many unknowns there with that rotation. There's a chance that it could turn around and it could be solid. But I agree. I think the, the safest, safest 
aspect of this team is that bullpen. Reynaldo Lopez moving to the bullpen was was huge for him. They you know came up as a starter as a prospect, but you know just just isn't really that kind of guy. Uh, and he's nasty out of the pen. So there you go. That's the White Sox. They'll probably win 82 games similar to the Brewers. <laughs> yeah. No, I, it, I'm really interested to see how that how that team shakes out. Me too. So I have – now we go to the West, right? It's the West. The West. So we've got an obvious one here with the Dodgers, which this was this was impossible. It was like, okay, what are the Dodgers best at? And I ultimately, you know, I would say it was lineup or bullpen. And, and I know we're specifically going infield or outfield. Obviously, the outfield is – Probably the biggest question mark for the Dodgers, right? So that's obviously not a strength. So it's going to be infield or bullpen. And if I'm comparing their infield versus their bullpen, I'll probably go with their bullpen. Uh, and that's the craziest thing because I think that their their lineup solid. But if we're comparing just the infield or the bullpen, I'm going to go with the bullpen. So I mean, this is a team that they manufacture relievers like none other. They spawn them for lack of a better word. And, you know, I think the perfect example, the guy that really put me over the edge with just like the way they spawn dudes was Yancy Almonte. When I saw Yancy Almonte throw, I was just like, okay, this is just annoying at this point. Like, where do you create these dudes? But there's, there's a little bit of reservation because I'm like, okay, do they have that established back end guy? But as we've started to realize with, with bullpens like the Dodgers and, and the giants two years ago, it's like, okay, they have so many dudes that they are comfortable with that you'll end up finding them at the end of the year with five different guys who have multiple saves and three different guys who have eight plus saves. Daniel Hudson probably be the guy who can shut the door for them. But what about Evan Phillips? He was one of the best relievers in baseball last year. Alex Vesia, nasty lefty, Bruce Star, Gratterall. Like he's still 24. I, I keep waiting for Gratterall to make that leap because he throws 102 with movement. Doesn't get the whiffs you'd expect, but he's 24. Caleb Ferguson, solid arm. Shelby Miller is a name to watch, right? Like this was somebody that really, really impressed with the fastball shape last year. The stuff looked really good. He could be a factor. And then you got Phil Bickford as well. If they get anything out of fire icing this year, who should be back at some point in the second half, he didn't give up a run until he went down. And then Blake Trinan's another, you know, another guy that we got to wait and see what they get from him. But those are two guys that are kind of house money. The bullpen's already great without them. And both of those guys could be factors in the second half. And not only factors could be dominant in the second half. So for me, just almost top to bottom, I would almost trust any of these guys shutting the door for me in the ninth inning. That's the sign of a very good bullpen. That's the point. Outside of Shelby Miller, I would venture to say every single arm in the Dodgers bullpen could either be a great setup man or a closer for a different team. And if they get a healthy Trinan back, I personally think when Blake Trinan is healthy, he is about as good as any reliever I've ever seen. The pitches that he throws, the the sinker that he throws at 97 that just dives out of the zone, the big breaking ball. When I'm watching Dodger games and I'm watching Blake Trinan, I don't know how anyone puts bat on ball. No, it doesn't make sense and to me. Bruce Dar Gratterall, his stuff doesn't move the same, but it's faster. Vessia has that dog in him. Ferguson is a stud. Evan Phillips could be a top 10 reliever in the game. Yeah. And yeah. Daniel Hudson has World Series pedigree. Like, he could still be a really good arm in that bullpen. From top to bottom, is this not the best bullpen in baseball? Dude. It, it, it very well could be talk about like and and here's the thing is you say like the one guy you don't trust is Shelby Miller absolutely totally get it he's kind of gross like I think yeah. he found something injuries have been the big issue for him but he is a data darling and he was nasty in the minors last year his ERA at the big league level you only threw seven innings is inflated because he had one outing where he gave up five runs against the Padres but other than that, he went two and two thirds against Arizona, struck out seven. He went two innings against Colorado, struck out five. And then he went one inning against Arizona, struck out one. And all of those were scoreless outings. And he had the one five run outing. He had a sub two ERA and triple A, punching out a ton of dudes too. Uh, I think he had almost 11 Ks per nine and 21 innings there. Like <laughs> if that's your, your, I hope it works out for him reliever, you're in great shape because that guy could end up being dynamite and a lights out dude and then again they've got two guys in fire Eisen and trinan who are disgusting legitimately fire Eisen did not give up a run for 20 plus innings last year so that bullpen is is ridiculous and could potentially get better and 
They've got guys in the minors that can plug in there, right? If Ryan Pepio doesn't end up being a starter for them, I love him as a reliever. That's mid nineties that could tick up to upper nineties with a freak change. Uh, like they've got other dudes in the minors that could plug in and be a force in that bullpen as well. But maybe the best overall unit in baseball is the Houston Astros infield. And if you told me it was the rotation, sure. If you told me it was the outfield with Jordan and left Tucker and right and Chaz in center. Sure. If you told me it was the bullpen with their slew of fireballers, similar to the Dodgers. Sure. But adding Jose Abreu made this unit as good as anything I could imagine. Alex Bregman, perennial, not all-star, could be an MVP candidate. Jeremy Pena could not only win the gold glove, be considered one of the best defensive players at the position, and is now in year two offensively where he's only getting better and is the World Series MVP. Jose Altuve was the fourth best hitter in baseball last year by WRC+. Plus. Could have won an MVP if Aaron Judge and Shoya Otani didn't exist. And his teammate, Jordan Alvarez. <laughs> like, that's where then he was, like, basically as a player. Then at first base, you have the 2020 MVP that is consistent of a bat that we have in Major League Baseball in Jose Abreu. Does it get better than that? And then, of course, you have Martin Maldonado, who has this incredible relationship with the entire pitching staff, and he could hit 100, and it wouldn't matter. The Astros are not moving off him. They had a chance to get Wilson. They even got Christian Vasquez and didn't put him in. There's a reason. The Astros are anything but stupid. They know what they have in Maldonado. They know that relationship, how important it is for guys like Framber, Javier, Luis Garcia, and will now be Hunter Brown. This infield is as good of a unit in the last decade in Major League Baseball. It is that good, the Astros infield. Yeah, that's another one where it's just like you could pick anything, right? <laughs> like, it, there's no wrong answer. And I sent it in in our group chat, in our uh, just baseball staff chat, and I said, what's better? You know, their, their, their rotation or their lineup? And, and then Colby Olsen, you know, our guy said, yes. And, and that's literally <laughs> the answer, just yes. <laughs> it's just so, so dominant. Um, the Astros are, are they figured it out, man. They've got the Dodgers' ability to spawn arms. They've got the ability to develop talent like the Rays or the Dodgers as well. Uh, they do great in international free agency. They seem to draft pretty well. Uh, they don't spend as much as you'd think, but when they do spend, it's on guys like Jose Abreu where there's almost no risk and it just plugs right in. Like, it, it's just they are run so well. Uh, aside from the scandal and aside from the revolving door of CEO or of, of GMs, um, they still somehow continue to keep it moving and keep the line going. And I think it's just a testament to how how well the organization is run somehow, uh, despite all of the all of the turnover that they've had over the last however many years. I still think they're going to go back to the World Series. Yeah, uh, but we're of course going to have all of our World Series predictions, so I don't want to get too far into it. But yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah, and, and and for for the teams that feel left out, we're going to be doing previews for all of even the bad teams, right? Even even Tigers fans, you know, I know there's some of you listening. We will do a full preview of your team and and not make fun of them the whole time. Like, don't worry. Um, well, we will make fun of them. We will make fun, but but we will. It. But we'll highlight positives too, right? We'll tell we you what you got to look forward to. Uh, but we right now we're talking about the winners. Uh, so. Although this is a stretch that segues me into my last team and I think it's a stretch, but they did make additions. I think they're going to continue to try to make additions during the season and going into next year and whatever. So we throw them into the conversation here. They also were a 500 team last year, San Francisco giants. And honestly, you know what I realized that we were kind of reaching with the San Francisco giants, Peter is I struggled to find a definitive strength, but ultimately it's got to be the bullpen, right? Because I think when you look at at what they have, what they added, and what they've been in the past, the bullpen regressed last year. There's no way around that. It was the best bullpen in baseball, arguably, the year before that. You have Camilo Doval, who I know is one of your favorite players in, in baseball history, Peter. I mean, you have a 25-year-old Camilo Doval, who, who I think is going to continue to get better and better, was great last year. It doesn't You don't find much better stuff than that. They add Taylor Rogers as a free agent, who... I know he didn't have a Taylor Rogers year, but all of the underlying numbers are great. He still strikes out a ton of guys, and I think he's still going to be a really good arm for them. I think he's going to bounce back. They also have Tyler Rogers, who, is, who has been solid for them, regressed a little bit last year, but if, if he's somewhere between 2022 and 2021, I think that's a really solid arm for them. Less responsibility. He was in a lot of high leverage spots for them last year. Also a broadcaster's nightmare, Taylor Rogers and Tyler Rogers. That's going to be so annoying for road broadcasters. John Brebbia is a fine arm. Scott Alexander is somebody that, you know, I, I feel like could be 
one of the more underrated reliever arms because he is always hurt. But when he is on the field, he's been pretty good. He, he had a 104 ERA in 17 appearances. They used him as, a, as an opener. He also saved a pair of games. If he can stay healthy, that's another solid option for them. They have a lot of viable arms. And then Luke Jackson is an underrated signing, a guy that I think should be available relatively early in the season. And, and if Luke Jackson comes back, that's a guy that's you know pitched as a closer, that's pitched a lot of high leverage, still 31, coming off of Tommy John. He, he, you know, I think will help bolster this, this bullpen as well. And Jacob Junis was kind of solid in, in multiple roles. Also, it's a pretty deep bullpen, maybe not as much impact as you'd like to see, but I feel like Taylor Rogers helps with that, with the swing and miss stuff in the back end. Two things for you. First thing Padres fans just threw up because they thought, are we not included in the, biggest Oh, I accidentally, I, yeah, I got them. I got them here. You have one more team. Number two, can you plug your ears for a second so I can talk to Giants fans who are listening? Uh, because I don't want you to hear it. Okay. Just per- you can pretend to plug yours. Giants fans, I am trying to convince Arm, Jack, Colby, Ryan Finkelstein, because we all do our top tens together. I am trying to slide Camilo Duvall in as high as possible. I know he is a freak of nature. He throws 104. He has dirty off-speed stuff. He's going to be the best reliever in baseball, and I'm trying my best to convince them. I don't think they're going to agree with me, so when you see him ranked like 12, don't get mad at me because I'd put him like four. I'd put him like three because I think he's the best ever. So I, you guys know I have my favorite players. All right, arms back. You guys know I have my favorite players in baseball, and I get really biased about them, and I will ride or die till I die. Camilo Duvall is one of them. Cal Quantrill is one of them. Spencer Steer is becoming one of them. That's 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 the list right now. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll have some other guys, but the, the, these are the lists right now. These are the guys who, no matter what, I am on their team, and Camilo Duvall is that guy. I think he is as electrifying as any reliever in baseball. Even better in the second half, too. So, 1-9-3. Oh, 1-9-3 in the second half. Uh, so... This guy could be one of the best closers in baseball by the end of the season or by the middle of the season. And again, I, I really think Rodgers is going to be a dirty setup, man. I think he's going to settle into that new role. And then Fluke Jackson is your seventh inning guy. Spolpin's going to be pretty darn good. I can't believe I forgot the Padres. That's so funny. <laughs> so uh, I have two more teams. Aram has one more teams. And if we're talking about bullpens, the Seattle Mariners bullpen is as nasty as powerful as any unit in baseball even after trading eric swanson paul seawold nasty andres muñoz top five diego castillo could easily close matt brash one of the best sliders like we have in our game and as the four guy unreal pen murphy can be dirty Trevor Gott was like the seventh inning guy for the Brewers. Now he's like your bridge to the sixth inning guy. Matt Festa can be good. And Chris Flexen has a really good changeup, but can also be put in the rotation and might be the best sixth starter in Major League Baseball. Chris Flexen can be a good pitcher. The underlying numbers always hate him, but all he does is continue to outperform these guys. He's done it long enough. Soft contact. He's got really good command. And his stuff is relatively good. He has a really good changeup. This team is led by the bullpen, and this bullpen rivals the Dodgers, rivals the Astros, rivals the Guardians for the best in baseball. And similar to the Dodgers, every single arm I would trust to either close games or be an elite setup guy. And there's few teams in baseball that can say that. Mariners got it even after trading Eric Swanson. Robbie Ray is going to be so fire when they move him to the bullpen. Yeah. <laughs> and what's crazy, actually, jokes aside, all righties. But I, I also think that there's a level of, you know, with the new rule, but also in general, just where we get so caught up in splits and stuff like that. Would you rather have an okay lefty facing a left-handed hitter or just Andres Munoz? Like just, just have Andres Munoz throw 103 at him with a nasty slider. <laughs> like I think yeah, that'll be fine. Jake, Jake Diekman or Andres Yeah, Munoz. like would you rather like, Jake even Diek- Jake Diekman or Penn Murphy? Yeah, Penn right. Murphy. Like, I'd rather Penn Murphy. So I think that's the Mariners' approach here is like, okay, yeah, you can balance out with your lefties. We're just going to get every disgusting righty we can find. And they have become so good at this that they turn Eric Swanson into a freaking starting – one of their best hitters. One of their best hitters. So I love that they said fucking on the lefties. I love all of their righties. This is a team that I, I think – if we're talking about strengths, 
and, and you know how sometimes it's close. You can make the case for some or the others. If you said anything other than the Mariners bullpen for their strength, I would have just closed out the zoom. Like there is no debate anywhere. Like this team will ride its bullpen as far as it can get. And that's not to say that the other parts of the team are bad. It's just that's how much better the bullpen is than any other aspect of this team, I think. Their rotation is great, especially with the emergence of George Kirby. I really do like their rotation getting Luis Castillo. I mean, this is a great rotation. Yeah. The offense is very solid all around, but you look at the infield and it doesn't pop. It's good, doesn't pop. Mm-hmm. The outfield, you have Jared Kelnick and left. With J-Rod and Teoscar, and Jared good. Kelnick becomes Jared Kelnick. That's one of the best outfits in baseball, but we just don't know yet. What yep. we do know is that the bullpen is unbelievable. Yep. I'm totally with you. And and here's the, the team I forgot somehow, because again, this is another infield. Let's throw it right into the mix here with the San Diego Padres of another infield capable of being one of the best infields in baseball because they do it all right. I mean, Manny Machado, talking about a guy on a Hall of Fame track at the hot corner. Xander Bogarts added his shortstop one of the best shortstops in baseball and really made strides defensively last year. ha Kim at second base. He was a great defender at short. He would be one of the best defend- defensive second baseman. Him and Nico Horner, I think, are going to be competing. Two great defensive shortstops that just got moved because their team got a true more elite shortstop, I guess. And then Jake Cronenworth at first, like that's an interesting aspect of this. I don't know if they're going to use Matt Carpenter for, at first at all or, or, or you know how that's going to look, but Cronenworth's still a really solid first baseman. He's going to be very good defensively. I'd like to see a little bit more slug from my first baseman, but if that's your biggest weakness is Jake Cronenworth playing first, I think you're in pretty good shape. That guy was still a four win player last year, hit 17 home runs. And I think he's going to kind of take a step forward again, offensively. He took a bit of a, of a step back last year with a one Oh nine WRC plus he has a one fourteen for his career thus far. I think he'll be closer to that. This is a really good infield man on the defensive side and on the offensive side. With what Manny and Xander can do offensively, with what Kim can do with the glove, and how good he was in the second half offensively. You know, Kim took some some big steps forward with the bat and still is young. And then I still think, you know, at the baseline, Cronenworth is still an above average bat, even at the first base position. And then, of course, a catcher. That's the one question. I guess I forgot catcher. If Noah's healthy, he's an average catcher. I still believe in Luis Camposano. We talk about guys that were going to just die on that hill. Camposano is a guy that I really believe in the bat. So we'll see where he fits in there too. But at least, you know, they don't have a great catcher, but at least they have a backup plan of a guy that's a top 100 prospect who can really hit. So there's a backup plan at the catching position too. That's my only problem. Why this Padres infield compared to some of the other best infields in baseball doesn't quite meet the mark because of the questions that catcher. It's not that Nola is a bad catcher. He's just not a good catcher. I yeah. guess is fair. And Luis Campisano, you believe in him, and I tend to believe in prospects that you believe in. <laughs> but do the Padres believe in him? I don't is think so. I... Like, what's going on there? Yeah. So that's the only separator because you look at second base, shortstop, third base, and first base, it's as good as any of the four in Major League Baseball, but it doesn't quite reach like the Astros or even the Guardians. I think it's kind of in that boat. Guardians of- would be a fun debate because on the surface, you know, I think a lot of people would jump at the Padres, but if you really dive into it, it's probably closer than people think. I think a big part of that would ride on what you get from Ahmed Rosario this year, but Rosario seemed like he's gotten a lot better. And I like a lot of the infield depth that the guardians have. My, my last thing on, on the Padres too, is, is the bullpen you could almost make a case for too. Uh, I think this bullpen is going to be pretty darn good between Josh Hader and Robert Suarez on the back end. We know how much they paid Robert Suarez. Uh, Luis Garcia, not bad at all. Tim Hill is funky and weird from the left side. I love Jose Lopez, the rule five pick and Drew Pomerantz. We'll see what they get from him. But ultimately that that infield is just it's just a little bit more eye catching and a little bit more impactful. And the the rotation top three are great, but I, I can't go with the two the two converted relievers in Nick Martinez and Seth Lugo at four and five. If they go get a Pablo Lopez or go get another starter, you could make that case too. And then all of a sudden we're looking at a really balanced team top to bottom. But uh, yeah, I think the infield is just too dominant. Wrapping up the episode with the Los Angeles Angels. This is kind of a tough one uh, because they have a hole at every unit. Um, (laughs) 
Their outfield is great. Their infield is could be good, especially with Logan Ohapi emerging on the scene. The rotation is pretty solid. I mean, Otani, Anderson, and Sandoval, that's a great front three. Yeah. And Reed Detmers has flashed real potential. And Jose Suarez is a good five. Their bullpen is garbage, but and you know, but adding Tucker Davidson as the number six in the rotation, he, he is going to be one of the better sixes in Major League Baseball if he wins out on that job. Um, but I decided on the outfield is the best of this squad, partially because Mike ah, Trout is in it. You and Mike to- Trout is pretty freaking good. Yeah. Um, he's going to hit 50 home runs if he's healthy because he hit 40 in like 130 games last year. Still on the field, one of the best players in Major League Baseball. But Taylor Ward really came on at in his age 28 season and played really well, and he's projected this year to be an 800 OPS guy with 20 plus bombs. That's yeah, a really good player, and he was all. What was he an All Star last year? Is he an All Star? He had Early to be close right? to it. He was I, in that fringe where I feel he's... like everyone was an All Star. Right? He had to yeah. be an All Star. He was at least close. He and should have been if he was. He, he played it because at first half he was even better, right? Like, and, and I know he, he tapered off a little bit in the second half, but then finished strong again. Uh, Taylor Ward's good, man. I, I broke down his swing changes. Why, why, why I'm really buying what he's selling. And this is a dude that played right field at a high level, plugged in at center when Trout was out, even played a couple games at third. Like he's versatile. I, I love Ward. And when you have Ward complimenting Mike Trout, that's really fun. And then you know, I know you're not a big Hunter Renfro fan, but he's not a hole at that spot, yeah. right? Like that's, that's what that's, I was gonna he's say. He's gonna carry his weight. And and that's what the Angels have been missing is guys that can carry their weight and then some. He's probably a 750-ish OPS guy who hits 25 home runs and plays a fine corner. They That's need a, that. <laughs> they need that. So, like, that is that is viable. Like, do I think that he's going to be great in three years? Eh, probably not, but we're not talking about three years down the yeah. line. We're talking about next year where he should hit his home runs, he should hit his doubles, and he's going to throw a lot of guys out at home. And that's a good right fielder. And then when you combine that with Mike Trout yeah. and Taylor Ward, it's a very good outfield. That's the thing. The, the only way that that it, the strength isn't the outfield when you have arguably the greatest center fielder of all time or one of the greatest center fielders of all time and then a, an all-star caliber player is if they had legitimately a nobody out there and right. And, and Renfro is, is better than a nobody. He's a two-win player. He's been that you know three of his last four years. And, and I think he's going to be something around that this year. So and we'll that, see that is a – Joe Adele. We'll see what we yeah. get from Joe Adele. It, that, that's another alternate, right? Like that's another depth piece there too. They might get something from Joe Adele, um, which makes that outfield a little bit, a little bit safer. So yeah, I agree. That outfield is crazy uh, potentially. And if Renfro is close to what he was last year, then that outfield could actually low key be one of the better in baseball, assuming that Ward continues to do what he did, which I think he will. Um so that, that was a little bit easier, I think, than the Giants, because at least the Angels have some star power. But we we, we always talk about that. So that's about it for this episode. Right. We're going to talk weaknesses of bad teams next week, which should be pretty fun. And strengths and, and strengths strength. and strengths of the bad teams. Don't worry. But weaknesses of bad teams is going to be pretty fun to kind of go back to what you were saying about exactly. how it's fun to make fun of bad teams. Um, but it, we'll, we'll highlight some positives, too. The three of us will be back together for tomorrow's episode it's going to be a late your record. turn your it's turn my for the turn. questions I i'm going to be sit- i'm going to be sitting up i've been already been thinking about it but i'm going to sit up all night with my questions people really seem to enjoy those episodes so i'm excited to do another one we might just keep them going like revolving until we get to the season but um world baseball classics start starting to get closer to finalizing those rosters so again i know we've talked about it a lot in terms of look out for that coverage but we're really excited to do that um uh, but i'm pumped for my for my question is it eight or nine Nine, eight. Uh, it is eight. Eight, eight. big old questions, and I eight want them. To I hope you're ready. Glusting. I'm not even ready. I can't even imagine what they're going to yeah. be, and that's why you got to tune in for Friday's episode. Get your just baseball merch. Best way to support us. It is in the episode description. But if you don't want to spend a single dollar, I totally understand. If you could give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify, and if you're watching this on YouTube, hit subscribe. us with a like. Hit the subscribe button and leave a comment of what you think could be the biggest strength. And if we didn't cover your team, sorry, man. I just didn't make the cut. It didn't make the cut. I don't know what to tell you. But, of course, we're going to be going over every team in later episodes. And you'll find plenty of content 
on JustBaseball.com. We have a bunch of new podcasts coming out of the network, which we'll continue to update you guys. And opening day will be incredible. It is still about, what, 70 days away or something like that? It's coming quick. It's coming quick. And and again, I want to plug Show and Go with Taylor Davis. Really pumped about that. Dylan Cease interview coming out soon. Um, Really, really pumped to listen to that one. But opening day is creeping up, man. We're going to have spring training and the WBC and then lead us right into the baseball season. So, you know, you know, we'll be covering everything and previewing everything here on the just baseball show with some top 10 sprinkled in. And with that, thank you everybody.